Hey guys, I just want to tell you real quick that all the teaching slides that I'm about to go over in this video, I'm going to make them available on our Patreon. And that way you guys can go over there. Um, you, it's an easy way to support us. A lot of people have been doing it. It's You can anywhere from a dollar a month to $100 a month, just whatever God puts in your heart. And that that will give you access to all these actual teaching slides I'm going to upload in a PDF format. If you want to actually download them to your own computer and use them and share them, spread them with friends or family or whatnot, or just for your own resource. A lot of people like to physically collect their own stuff. Um, but I want to make those available to you. And so I'm going to do that with several videos that I have, um, not only uh, this one, but also uh, milk and meat presentation that we did a few nights ago uh, concerning when the day begins. And also going forward, I wanna make more slides, more teaching slides available that are you know kind of polished and put together that you can consider and study and download to your own, uh, your own phone or computer. So you guys go over to Patreon, the link is in the description below, and that way you can check those out and have access to that. So Hi there, thanks for joining me for a special episode of Honor of Kings. We're going to look at the book of 1st Enoch in its history and its timeline. Scholars who study manuscripts that have been preserved throughout the years, they have a familiarity with when the manuscripts have been around, who's had possession of them, where they were transferred to, which university or which museum has studied them, um, under what type of scrutiny throughout the years, because that's part of their culture, their atmosphere, their world, their job, you know, their purview. But the average person, they don't have a clue where these manuscripts have been or where who's handled them over time. Uh, how many people have had access to the manuscripts that are available and which manuscripts are available over time. This episode will look at that those very concepts with the book of first Enoch because most people are under the impression that it was somehow lost or you know hidden away until it was rediscovered in the 19 late 1940s with the Dead Sea Scrolls but that that's just not entirely accurate so we wanted to look at its history and its timeline thanks for joining me the book of Enoch is highly controversial Catholics and Protestants will call it anything between deuterocanonical or apocryphal. Scholars will consider it pseudepigraphal. It is a book that challenges many people in what they think they understand from the scriptures. A lot of folks who have a surface level understanding of the scriptures can be very confused trying to weed through the book of First Enoch, not realizing how the chapters are composed in the most common translations, nor do they realize some of the language that's being used requires a familiarity with the Old Testament of the Bible. So unfortunately, a lot of our modern day churches, they do not encourage um, thoroughly, not only studying the Old Testament, but believing it and understanding it because they, they don't think it's applicable to their life today. This is a form of supersessionism or dispensational teachings that are per, uh, permeate many of, the, many of the churches in the United States specifically, but also in other countries around the world where they think that the Old Testament is somehow synonymous with instructions that are no longer applicable to our lives on the grand scale. Uh, they kind of pick and choose from some of them. And that as a result of that, the average person sitting in the pew going to a church does not dig in and study books like Ezekiel or books like Isaiah, um, where you would get a lot of the verbiage and the terminology from those prophets 
that you also see in the book of uh, Enoch, the book of First Enoch, and that's it, there be, creates a disconnect in really being familiar with the verbiage, the terminology, the language, and to be honest with you, if, if you don't know the Torah, then some of the things that are actually going down in the book of First Enoch can be confusing as well. So that that unfortunately is something we try to cover on Honor of Kings um, with all of our other episodes as we've done, I think, 14 or 15 episodes in the book of Enoch, both in season one and season two. But this particular episode, we just want to review some of the actual history of the manuscript and how it's composed and uh, who's had it over time. The two most popular translations are from R.H. Charles and Richard Lawrence. R.H. Charles lived between 1855 and 1931, was a professor in Greek at Trinity College and Archdeacon of Westminster in 1919. He translated First Enoch from the Giaz and the Greek, combining them together and using textual criticism. Richard Lawrence was from 167, excuse me, seven. Richard Lawrence lived from 1760 to approximately 1838. He was a professor of Hebrew at Oxford and the Archbishop of Cashel in 1822. He translated First Enoch from the Giaz with help from Latin and English translations provided to him by a guy named James Bruce. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture available of Richard Lawrence. I couldn't find one in the history books. James Bruce was a gentleman that lived between the eight times of 1730 and 1794. The actual date of his death is actually uh, speculated. It's not set in stone in history. He was a Scottish traveler and writer and cartographer who spent many years in Ethiopia and North Africa looking for the source of the Blue Nile. Many times in history you'll hear him referenced with the word Abyssinia, which is uh, just a different, uh, a different word that was used for Ethiopia in the past. James Bruce offered copies of First Enoch in the Giaz language to Richard Lawrence. They were already translated into Latin and English, and that's presumably that were done by the King's Court of France. So James Bruce went and spent many years, well, approximately two years in Ethiopia, learning um, the culture, spending time with the people, and he asked for permission to write down and copy many of their scriptural books. And supposedly, at least the ones that historians claim are you know, recorded to him, was about 27 different books. And one of those, he had multiple copies of the Book of Enoch that he brought back and he presented to, I believe, um, the King of France and also um, some other nobles and people that you know he was in cahoots with basically because he was uh he was a con what we would call a connected man he knew people and he um they knew him and uh he and the reason for that was because he was a part of a secret society that many of the wealthy nobles and rulers of nations are a part of we'll go over that in just a few minutes so the big thing here that we want to look at is what's the difference between richard lawrence in his translation versus rh charles's translation now, Richard Lawrence, his translation was in the, around the mid-1800s, whereas R.H. Charles was at the beginning of the, 19, or the 20th century. So I think Richard Lawrence, his translation was um, approximately in the 1838, and then R.H. Charles was more in like 1911 and 1917. So what's interesting is R.H. Charles uses the Greek and the Ethiopian Giaz. He combines them together in his translation. He does this through brackets to try to show you if there was one piece of the scroll missing that the, that the Greek filled in. He put that in there and then vice versa. So that way you try to get you know as much information between the two translations as possible. Um, whereas Richard Lawrence just did more of a poetic interpretation where he took the information that was available to him, both from translations James Bruce provided and also what he was learning about the Giaz, and he tried to make the best of it and create a translation. So many scholars now view Richard Lawrence's translation as obsolete because there are so many more manuscripts that are now available after the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's been more study throughout the, the Ethiopian Giaz to, to try to line up what's what from the original uh, copies of the Book of Enoch, which as we'll look over the timelines, those date back all the way to even the third century BC. What's interesting though is James Bruce brought translations already provided to this gentleman who studied Hebrew, right, which was this Richard Lawrence. Well, many people might think, oh, that's awesome because, you know, wasn't Enoch, you know, eventually, you know, if, if the writings are attributed to Enoch, then wasn't he a part of the, the ancestors of ancient Israel? Therefore, he would have been considered Hebrew, even though the, the actual person Eber hadn't been born yet. So the terminology of Hebrew wasn't yet established. But he's of that same lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Noah, even further back, would be Enoch himself. 
So it seems like in our mind, people that think, oh, Hebrew, the scriptures were originally written in Hebrew. So therefore, this Hebrew professor would be the best person to translate it. Yet the most copies that were available during that time were in the Ethiopian that had the full copy. And then we also had the Greek had the largest fragments until they found the Dead Sea Scrolls where they found Aramaic copies that were completely intact that we uh, that are privately held unfortunately that people can't study but the largest other fragments they found were of the Greek copies that do match up with the Ethiopian the best out of all the other ones that were available so that's the uh, that is the unique question in history is why didn't James Bruce just publish the copies that he already had well because he wasn't someone that was in academia. He wasn't in a person or a place that would get any good credit for trying to publish works like these because no one no one considered him you know, credible in that regard. Um, like I said before, he was a traveler, he was a writer and a cartographer. He wasn't someone that was the archbishop of some place, right, of an actual college um, or a professor in Greek and Hebrew. So therefore he hands it off to someone who is a professor in Hebrew at an established you know, um, accredited college that people respected so that if he published it, then that publication would actually hold weight. So if you read in the history of James Bruce, when he came back from his many travels in Africa, much of it being in Ethiopia, he tried to speak with people in London to get his stories told, not just about the religious books that he copied, but about all his other travels, right? He had adventurous stories that he was trying to share with people back in England when he got back. And many of the, um, many of the uh, the publications, the, the newspapers, the article writers, they thought he was just making up fairy tales, right? Because he was like, this is too fantastical. People won't believe this. So he already was struggling with the idea of being accredited for trying to publish something that people would take seriously. So you hand it off to someone that everyone already takes seriously. He publishes under his name. Boom. You've got, you know, a full on accredited translation. But thankfully, gentlemen like R.H. Charles come along later. He's also accredited by people that, you know, um, considered him serious in the field. And he actually is a professor of Greek, which is really important because that was some of the largest fragments that matched the Ethiopian during those days were Greek fragments. So let's look real, real quick about some of the history of James Bruce. Now, why you may ask, why are you making a big deal about this James Bruce guy? Well, if we look closely at who he was and who he was connected to, and why he would be the gentleman that would try to get something published. Well, there's a lot of questions that may start to arise. James Bruce was a Scottish Freemason. He was initiated in Lodge Canongate Kilwinning, uh, Kilwinning uh, number two on August 1st, 1753. The Lodge history detailing his initiation in the Lodge reads, Bruce James, younger of Kennard, the Abyssinian traveler. If anyone's familiar with the long history and modern day <laughs> secret society that's still active, um, that is popu a secret society that's populated by uh, current presidents, kings of the earth, um, heads of state, famous wealthy people, uh, celebrities. This is the, the secret society of the Freemasons um, is built upon occultic principles that are passed down from ancient Egypt. And a lot of people don't realize this. Now, What's really interesting is if you really do your theological research into what scripture teaches, you find out that the occultic practices are actually passed down from the watchers, which the book of Enoch itself introduces all the secrets of heaven to men that they were striving to learn, which caused them to corrupt themselves and to create violence on the earth and literally led to the behavior that initiated the flood in Genesis six. So mankind was exponentially increasing it's violence towards each other and it's a it's non-scriptural behavior right it's behavior that was the antithesis of what the creator asked them to be like right the creator said i've created you here's guidelines on how to behave how to love one another how to treat the earth and they were doing the opposite because the rebellious angels called the watchers were teaching mankind things that they weren't supposed to know and encouraging cultic worship idolatry worship all this stuff began before the flood and this is what was picked up after the flood according to the book of jubilees and that we see fleshed out in exodus deuteronomy numbers and the rest of the old testament where the nations were rejecting the ways of the creator yahweh 
trying to do their own behavior. Much of it was mixed in with occultic practices, rituals, and rites. Ancient Egypt was notorious for worshiping false gods, having a pantheon of gods that they worshiped, and they also inducted their initiates into these occultic rites and rituals. So there's been people that have come out of Freemasonry that have given their sworn testimony. These are people that were supposedly at the you know 31st and 32nd degree level, which is really high up and really accomplished in that secret society. And they said when they got to a certain level, a ceremony was done for them and uh, to basically initiate them into the, the level above, right, to get higher up. And that during this ceremony, they brought out a bunch of Egyptian iconography and statues and images, and they revealed to them the true name of God, which wasn't Yahweh, right, or Yahuwah, or anything resembling the Hebrew God of the Bible, but was an ancient Egyptian God. And that was what they told him was what their true foundational beliefs were. This is a secret society that has carried itself over from the ancient belief systems of ancient Egypt. So the book of Enoch is of great interest to those in the occult. They absolutely are interested in its information because they already worship the Nephilim, who are introduced in the book of Enoch as well, as being the offspring of the rebellious angels and, and human women as well as the fallen angels. So the, the, the occult will worship both of those entities as the you know uh, ascended masters, right? The, the enlightened ones that they pattern their, their lives after and hope to attain that type of status when they die. This whole concept is built upon secret knowledge in a secret society. And it's very suspect to me personally that this gentleman comes back with the Giaz translation in Giaz has other people translate it to Latin and English and then provides those new translations to a gentleman to get it published as he's trying to learn Giaz as well. So you've got another guy about a hundred years later who doesn't have that type of influence. He's using the Greek and the Giaz and trying just to put them both together and show you the fullness to the best of his ability. So me personally, that's why I look towards the R.H. Charles translation a little more than the Richard Lawrence translation. And I know there's other translations out there, even some newer ones as of 2008, um, which, which make a lot of different claims. But as far as the theology that's being translated from the, from the original text to the English translation, in my opinion, the R.H. Charles makes the most sense of the entire Book of Enoch and is consistent theologically as far as everything that's introduced and taught in comparison with the American Canon of 66. And that is one of the foundational ideas that we try to present here on Honor of Kings when we look at these, these uh, other scriptural books and we try to see why were either these taken out of the American Canon or why weren't these included to begin with. And this is whereas they're included in other canons all around the world. And let's, let's get to those, those ideas as well. But before we do, let's look at the Greek, right? Because we're looking again at who's handled these manuscripts over the last 2,000 to 2,500 years. In what possession have they been? Who's been studying them? Um, has it really been lost this whole time? I'm going to suggest to you it's not. Because if we look here 100 years before James Bruce, we see a gentleman named Joseph Justice Scaliger, and he lived between 18, 1540 and 1609. He was a French scholar who studied Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. He published the Greek fragments of 1st Enoch in 1606. He was considered the father of determining a rational procedure subject to fixed laws for textual criticism and emendation. He was considered an irreconcilable Protestant by the Catholic Church and was the target of Jesuit character attacks to discredit his scholarship. So why would they do that? Why would they attack this guy? Why would they call him irreconcilable Protestant, right? Because he had broken away from Catholic doctrine uh, and beliefs, and he was a part of this Protestant movement, and he was actually trying to publish the Book of First Enoch because he thought it was important, yet, you know, they, the Catholic Church didn't want that happening, so they were trying to actually discredit his scholarship. But that's in the 1600s. If we go even further back, 800 years before that, what do we find? We find a gentleman named George Sinkelos. Um, he lived approximately from 750 to 810 AD. He was a Greek-speaking monk and a chronicler during the Byzantine Empire who lived in Palestine. 
He was credited with attempting to compose a chronography of the world in Greek and is said to have possession of the ancient Greek fragments, supposedly chapters 1 through 36 of the Book of First Enoch. So this is going to be, let's look at the, you know, the idea here of R.H. Charles is in the late 1800s, early 1900s. You've got Richard Lawrence in the late 1700s, early 1800s. You've got this, um, this just, uh, Joseph, you've got, uh, Joseph Justice Scaliger, who was even before that, from the 1500s to the 1600s, but 800 years before that, guys. You've got George Sinkelos, and he was a Greek-speaking monk who was a chronicler, which means he's like a scribe. I mean, he's writing down stuff. Did you guys know that he actually tried to create a chronography of the world? And what that means is he tried to write a history, you know, volumes of books that would span and cover the history of the world. So in his efforts to create an accurate history of the world up until his day in the 8th century AD, he's using the information from the Greek version of the Book of Enoch for his chronography. That means this guy trusted the information within the, the Book of First Enoch as part of true history of the world leading up to that time. It's pretty fascinating. So if we look at other places in history, we see that the Greek fragments of the Book of Enoch um, they were found buried in a grave in Akmim, Egypt in 1886. Um, now, they were also buried alongside the Apocalypse of Peter, which is kind of interesting. Again, we have this thing of these Greek fragments that have come up, right? Because remember, like I said, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they realized that the Greek fragments matched the Ethiopian better than all the other languages that they found translated. So it's unique that throughout history, we have Greek scholars continuing to try to publish the Greek fragments of the Book of Enoch, considering them credible and a part of true history. If we look again here in the mid 1800s, we had a gentleman named Henry Barclay Sweet. This gentleman actually was a professor, uh, the Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge in 1890. In 1877, he published the Greek text of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint, and included the Book of First Enoch. And this is actually uh, an image from the, the cover of one of those books you can find on Amazon, which is basically a Greek version of the Bible, guys. And you can see that in the table of contents, he includes First Enoch in his translation of the Greek Old Testament. I think it's pretty fascinating um, that this gentleman thought it was worthwhile to put in there because it matched <laughs> the theology, guys. This guy was a professor of divinity, so he didn't have any qualms about the Book of Enoch and everything it said inside of it. So I think that's pretty fascinating. As far as the actual Dead Sea Scrolls, we those were... A series of scrolls that have continued to be found uh, from the 1940s even up until the most recent discovery in 2017 and it's a dig site in Qumran which is a series of caves that they found these scrolls of ancient documents manuscripts many of them most of them which were scripture and the book of first Enoch was found with full and partial copies among the Dead Sea Scrolls and these four languages in Greek Latin Aramaic and Paleo Hebrew now the Paleo-Hebrew, it was the least of the fragments that were found of First Enoch. It's just very, very small fragments. But the Greek copies matched the Ethiopian manuscripts better than any of the other languages found. Unfortunately, the Aramaic copies are privately held, and we can't actually critique those in, in modernity right now. So those, unless that private individual wants to bring forward those to a museum um, to be looked at and studied, uh, or put online at some point, but unfortunately right now we just have the Greek, the Latin, and little bitty pieces of the Paleo-Hebrew, but then we have the full Ethiopian text, which we're going to go over in a minute, has been around forever. Let's look at the actual construction of the Book of First Enoch, right? These are the actual scrolls that were making the composition of the Book of First Enoch. You've got one called the Apocalypse of Weeks, the Fragments of the Book of Noah, the Dream Visions, the Holy Book of Luminaries, the Parables, and then an untitled portion. Now remember guys, other people, other scholars over time have given the titles to these scrolls that comprise the Book of First Enoch. So this, in the Book of First Enoch and the original languages themselves, it doesn't say this is the Apocalypse of Weeks and this is, you know, the, the, the parables of the, the fragments of the Book of Noah, that kind of stuff. They just are, that's their, you know, their insertion, if you will, and trying to organize the material to make it more understandable. But these are the actual manuscripts that go into what we call First Enoch that we can access today. 
So let's look at those manuscripts and let's look at where they came from in the timeline. And we're going to look as far back as the 6th century BC, because that's when something significant happened in the history of scripture. So this is actually when Ezra restores 204 scrolls. He was a high priest. He was a, a part of the you know Israelites, one of them returning from uh, the, all the Israelites that were returning from the exile in Babylon. And he was in charge, he and Nehemiah, uh, they were in charge of trying to help rebuild the temple as well as get the people back into following the ways of Yahweh. And he was commissioned to actually go and, and take other scribes and copy um, all, this, all the manuscripts they had available at that time. So that means, guys, this is a situation where Enoch comes from this collection, all the manuscripts that were copied, right? It's going to be coming from, he would have been restoring and copying the manuscript of Enoch that they had at that time. And we don't even know how long the Giaz manuscripts were available. So the other, this just to show you a little bit of a timeline here, the first century AD is at the bottom of this little chart, and that shows us when Jesus was walking the earth and, and um, ministering. So this is our, our time period that's leading up to Yeshua, his arrival. And this is where we start to see where these manuscripts are dated as far as the oldest copy that they can they can date them back to. And the reason why I keep saying this word copy, guys, is because when they find, like this you see here in the, in the yellow, and they find something that's considered back as far as the 4th century BC, that doesn't mean that that was when it was authored. That is a common practice that scholars will try to do, but that doesn't always happen because many of them realize that, oh, this is a manuscript that other nations had known and had and talked about for a long time. And we can only date this particular copy of this manuscript back to this time period, but they don't suggest that that was when it was actually authored. This is where we run into a problem of people taking words they don't understand that are used in scholarship, words like, pseudepigraphal and saying, well, okay, since we, we don't believe that Enoch wrote it, so therefore we'll call it pseudepigraphal. And therefore we're going to say, since the oldest copy we have is the fourth century BC, that, that that's when it was written because they have making a conscious choice that they don't believe Enoch was the actual author of that information. You see what I'm saying? So there's a lot of bias that goes into scholarship that we have to be very careful about when we're reading and taking information from others when they're claiming a book is, is valid or not. So this is the actual Apocalypse of Weeks, um, and it is, uh, it's commonly seen in most translations as chapters 12, 36, 91, and 98. You also have the Book of Noah. Um, this is also is dated back to you know, the, late third, uh, the late third, early second century BCE. And in, in most translations, you're gonna find parts of this book as represented as chapters six through 11, 54 through 55, 60, 65 through 69, and 106 through 108. So yeah, guys, I know it seems a little confusing, but this is why I'm trying to do this video to help you to understand that this book has been compiled from different manuscripts that they've had over time. So this is, uh, they did so trying to make sense of the, the, the pieces and the fragments that they had to make composition out of, where is it in the storyline? So that's why if you read the book of Enoch and you're trying to study it, you'll notice that it's not laid out in chronological order. And this is why I'm explaining because they took pieces from different fragments and tried to put them together with other fragments that made sense in context of what was being said. Also have the Dream Visions uh, scroll, and that was going to be uh, dated back to properly, or at least the last copy, that the oldest copy they found is dated back to about the 2nd century BC, and it's usually through chapters 88 through 90. Then you also have the Holy Book of the Luminaries dated back also to the 2nd century BC, and it's represented in most translations as chapter 72 through 82. And then the parables translation, which is going to be back to the late second century, early first century. That's when its oldest copy was dated back. And it's usually represented by chapters 37 through 71, 91, and then 104. And then lastly, you have the untitled portion, which is also dated back to the first century BC. That one's also represented as chapters one through five in most translations. So as you can see here, all the contents of the book of first Enoch the oldest copies they found of the different manuscripts that make up this book are dated back before Yeshua walked the earth. So that means this is a book that Yeshua has at his availability to study and read because it was restored and kept by Ezra. They took all the Hebrew literature and all the Hebrew scriptures and restored them. So that's, this means that Yeshua 
would be reading a book that was restored by Ezra, a high priest. That means the high priest thought this book was good, restored it, they started making copies of it over time, and then Yeshua has that as availability to read, understand, and learn to quote from, which is what I believe he's doing in several places and teaching from, which is also why we see in the Apostle Jude, this book also being quoted from because they had it at their availability as a part of their scriptures and their culture. So here's a quick little timeline of the things I've discussed, and I actually put this timeline up on the far left side. You can see King David, which would be about the 10th century BC, about a thousand years before Christ. 400 years later, you have the restoration of these scrolls by Ezra. You've got another 600 years later, Jesus walking the earth. 900 years after that, you've got George Sincellus, right? The Greek um, speaking gentleman from the Byzantine Empire, the chronicler that was actually using first Enoch in his chronography to tell the history of the world. Then about 800 years later, you have Joseph Justus Scaliger, the Frenchman, who understood Greek and Hebrew and Arabic, and he also published the Greek fragments of the Book of Enoch in 1606. About 100 years later, you have this, this unique encounter here with the Abyssinian traveler James Bruce, who gave translations to Richard Lawrence to publish, and that happened in um, the mid-19th century. But then in the tw early 20th century, R.H. Charles he takes the Book of Enoch, both from the Giaz and the Greek, and tries to make a publication out of it. This was before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, about 40 years before. And then now in modernity, you and I are watching this video because we're studying the Book of First Enoch. So <laughs> this is a huge timeline here that we've got of, of people all the way back from Ezra. So we've got about 2,400 years of this of this particular book being available for people to look at in different translations and that's going to be the reason why I'm, I'm going over this concept it's going to make sense at the end of why i'm saying that but in this little bracket here of time this is what we went over the different manuscripts that are called um you know the, the, the apocalypse weeks the book of noah the dream visions all the different ones that we went over they're all placed right here in this little part of the timeline this is a little graphic i made to show what was available both before the first century AD, which is the time of Yeshua, and then from the first century AD up to where we live today, and then what we have available today because of after the Dead Sea Scroll findings. So as you can see at the top here, the Paleo-Hebrew manuscripts, if they found fragments of the book of First Enoch written in Paleo-Hebrew, then that would definitely date it back pretty far into the third, fourth century BC. They found the Aramaic manuscripts, which also was a language that's being spoken, like, you know, the book of Daniel's written in Hebrew and Aramaic. So that, that dates it also back to, at minimum, the third century BCE, which you have uh, David, which you have Ezra would have been responsible for restoring those manuscripts. And then you have the Greek manuscripts, which were also dated back to that time period before the first century. And then the Latin manuscripts were also available before that, which was just why they would have been buried in the Dead Sea Scrolls to be found 2,000 years later. But what we don't know, as you can see at the bottom of the graph, is the Giaz manuscripts, which is uh, the language of the Ethiopians, which they claim to have had for, you know, almost a thousand years before Christ, which is why I put King David up there. Because if you do any research on the Ethiopian people and where they came from and who they're comprised of, both um, Levites and Danites, you start to realize, okay, these people were influential. They were a part of, they're people that the, the Israelis that interacted with, uh, specifically King Solomon, um, and they actually had Levites that went down there and you know were keeping the law for 3,000 years. I mean, they're literally on camera in a BBC documentary telling you that they've had the Torah for 3,000 years and that's why they follow it. And they believe in Christ, because this is what happens in the book of Acts where Philip meets the Ethiopian uh, treasure and he explains the book of Isaiah to him, particularly concerning Christ. And so now for the last 2000 years, all of them have put their faith in Christ because they understand the priesthood and Yeshua was prophesied to be a high priest. Therefore, it made perfect sense to them. And therefore they put their, in the fulfillment of the Messiah, just as the scripture said, make sense to them. And they easily believed uh, because they understood the priesthood in my opinion. But this whole concept is we don't know how long, uh, unfortunately, the, without me going to Ethiopia and being able to do my own documentary, um, I don't know and I haven't been able to find out how long the Giaz translation of the first Enoch book has been available before Christ walked the earth. So once we get to the first century here in the middle of this graphic, we see that some of the manuscripts became unavailable in historical uh, access. 
the Aramaic, the Paleo Hebrew, and the Latin, but then we have Greek manuscript always being available this whole time. And because we already talked about the 19th, 18th, and uh, 16th century and then even in the 9th century AD and then I'm gonna go back at the end of this video We're gonna review a quote from a guy from the 3rd century AD, right? And he's talking about uh, He's talking about um, the book of 1st Enoch as well Which means he would have had access to it in both the Giyas and in the Greek manuscript What we have the Giyas has always been available since Christ walked the earth the Giyas manuscript in Ethiopia has been available and even still available to today. And that's what the rest of the graph is there is the 21st century. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls made available now. Bits and pieces of the Paleo Hebrew. Um, the Aramaic is available, but it's, it's unfortunately the full copies are privately owned, as you see with the asterisk, and no one can actually study them. So they're technically unavailable. Uh, the largest fragments which were found from the Greek, those are definitely available to study and scrutinize. And then also the Latin manuscripts have been available since James Bruce had it commissioned from the Gias to be translated into Latin in approximately the 17th century. So now we have full full copies, of course, still available of the Gias as well. So if we look at this timeline again, we can see that the Ethiopian Gias manuscript has the high potential ability to have been available just as long as the Greek manuscripts, which would put it back to the third, fourth century BCE. And then, because we know that the Levites, who are people that were also uh, responsible for copying the, the scriptures to preserve them, they were already keeping the law of God and keeping the, you know, the instructions of the Torah. Uh, they're keeping the law of God and they're doing everything in Ethiopia as it was being done in Israel. They were practicing down there too. And this was a, it's a long-standing history and tradition, which is why they've always had their own canon. And in their canon, They've actually had the book of First Enoch and Jubilees this whole time, as well as the book of Second Ezra and other books. So the Ethiopian Christians, they keep biblical feasts of Leviticus and Levitical cleanliness and dietary laws as well. So here's an interesting part we have from 3rd century AD, where we have Tertullian. And he's someone that's considered like an early church father, a leader of the early church. And he was uh, talking about the genuineness of the prophecy of Enoch. And he has a famous quote here where he says, I'm aware that the scriptures of Enoch, which is assigned this order of action to angels, is not received by some because it is not admitted into the Jewish canon either. I suppose they did not think that having been published before the deluge, it could have safely survived that worldwide calamity, the abolisher of all things. If that is the reason for rejecting it, then let them recall to their memory that Noah, the survivor of the deluge, was the great grandson of Enoch himself, and he, of course, had heard and remembered from domestic renown and hereditary tradition concerning his great grandfather's grace in the sight of God, and concerning at his preaching, since Enoch had given no other change to no other charge to Methuselah than that he should hand on the knowledge of them to his posterity. Noah, therefore, no doubt might have succeeded in the trusteeship of his preaching, or had the case been otherwise, he would not have been silent, alike concerning the disposition of things made by God, his preserver, and concerning the particular glory of his own house. This particular quote here has Tertullian actually telling us that he is calling Enoch's scripture right off the bat, and he's claiming that it was under his understanding that it had been published before the deluge, which is the actual claims of the book itself. So here's where we get into some unique concepts, guys, because if you're a prophet like Enoch was called a prophet by the, the apostle Jude in Jude chapter one, verse 14, if you're a prophet, you your words have to be true. Otherwise people can't believe you. We'll run into a situation of credibility here where the Israelite people had already believed this book was preserved by their priesthood which means it instantly gives it credibility, and it's written by a dude who claimed to be a prophet, which is a huge charge in their culture, in their theology, their religion, because you can't have information that's considered imagined or fanciful or not accurate and be an actual prophet, especially when the majority of that information had to do with prophecy, telling future events, apocalyptic events, not only of uh, you know, the, the revelation of God in heaven and how things were in play over time, but also towards the end of the age, what's called the day of the Lord um, or the consummation of the ages. And the book of Enoch itself and all the, the composition of all of it from start to finish talks about prophecy all throughout the book. It talks about it um, 
it gives actually, you know, the prophecy of the 10 weeks and, and other places, it gives an actual breakdown of the entire history of the nation of Israel itself, even leading up to the second coming of Yeshua. It, it's a big deal. It's on par with Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Amos and all the other prophetic books that talk about these same events. So for them to, uh, the reason why the, the Pharisees would reject it is for the, you know, several reasons, but one of them would be exactly why Tertullian is saying this, is that they did not, it rubbed against what they taught in Judaism and what they wanted to believe. So therefore they would reject it into what they were now calling a canon, which was a, is a term that was made up over time to say, well, these collections of books that we like, they're authoritative. And the ones that we don't like, they're not authoritative. So all of it was based on bias. But let's look real quick at, at something else Tertullian said. He said, but since Enoch in the same scripture has preached likewise concerning the Lord, nothing at all must be rejected by us which pertains to us. And we read that every scripture suitable for edification is divinely inspired. But the Jews, it may now seem to have been rejected for that very reason just like all the other portions nearly which tell of Christ. Nor, of course, is this fact wonderful that they did not receive some scriptures which spoke of him, whom even in person, speaking in their presence, they were not to receive. To these considerations is added the fact that Enoch possesses a testimony in the Apostle Jude. So he's out, he's out now telling you guys they're rejecting this book because of Christ. They're rejecting Enoch because of Christ. What would that tell you guys? This is a, this is a quote-unquote early church father, this is a guy that believed in Christ, and he's looking at this book that he considered scripture. He's telling you that the modern day Pharisees of the day, the same people, you know, the same ilk of practice of Judaism that have rejected Christ to his face are doing, are rejecting the book of Enoch because of Christ. That's a big deal. What should that say of us when we look at this book and we're reject, why would we reject this book? It's a pretty big deal. So let's look real quick at Enoch 1, 2 through 3, chapters 104, 10 through 13, and then chapter 108, 1, because this is going to actually matter to the timeline that we looked at a minute ago as far as why are we even still talking about this today. And Enoch chapter 1, verse 2 through 3, said he looked up in, his, in a parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angel showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. So this is showing you right here that his writings were not intended for the generation that was around him in the day entirely, but also for a remote generation that was to come. And as you go through the actual content of the book of Enoch, you'll, you'll quickly see what he means because it talks about a ton of apocalyptic prophecy, much of it doing with to do with the day of the Lord, the, the second coming of Yeshua where he actually brings his kingdom down and establishes uh, peace on the earth and takes out the wicked, those who are destroying the earth. He also says in chapter 104, verse 10 through 13, And now I know this mystery, that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways, and will speak wicked words and lie, and practice great deceits, and write books concerning their words. But when they write down truthfully all my words in their languages, and do not change or minish aught from my words, but write them all down truthfully, all that I first testify concerning them, then I know another mystery, that books will be given to the righteous and to the wise, to become a cause of joy and uprightness and much wisdom. And to them shall the books be given. They shall believe in them and rejoice over them, and then shall all the righteous who have learned from there, excuse me, and learned there from all the paths of uprightness be recompensed. Guys, he is actually telling you that his words, he's prophesying that his words will be written, written down and made books out of in many different languages. What have we been just been talking about for the last 25 minutes? All the different languages that this book was preserved in over time. And now we have available in many different languages to study today. It's very interesting. Let's look at chapter 108 and verse 1. Another book which Enoch wrote for his son Methuselah and for those who will come after him and keep the law in the last days. So guys, I don't know if you believe that you're in the last days today or not, but I do. And I think that that's why this book is such a controversial topic of today, is that it's information that has to do, a ton of information that has to do with understanding the laws of God as well as the second coming of Yeshua and how they're intertwined together, which is also just on par with other prophecies like in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 8, 
um, as, as well as other places in Scripture where we realize that at his coming, you're going to have people that are keeping the law again in the last days, which means at some point they weren't, but then they come back to doing it. And this is what Deuteronomy actually mentions, that we are calling to mind these instructions um, because we had been scattered throughout the earth and the different influences and we, you know, our discipleship was, is muddied down by a bunch of confusion and bad influence and people are actually coming to clarity in the last days. And he's saying, this is a book I'm writing specifically for these people. To me, it seems like a, a wonderful resource that the Father has provided. And to me, it gives that much more reasoning for this book to be so controversial that some people would want to dismiss it or hide it or claim that you shouldn't read it, that it's going to somehow confuse you. And when the book itself is telling you it's for a specific generation, even in the last days, who's, who's abiding in a specific behavior. This is why I've said before that unless you understand the law and the prophets, this book may not make much sense to you. Are you one of those who's keeping the law in the last days? If you are, this book is going to make a ton of sense to you. So I hope this has been encouraging, and I hope that um, you will go and you will test these books and line, try to line them up with the canon of 66. Now, what that's going to require is that you read and study the American canon of 66 so that you can actually properly test the book of Enoch. That is the challenge, and that's what we hope to inspire people to do with this show, Honor of Kings. And um, thanks for watching, guys. It's been a fun episode. We hope to see you next time.